in terms of uh, like sort of soft skills or or um, other qualities to me passion and empathy are really mm-hmm. important so the ability um to, to see that someone is passionate about what we do i mean especially what we do is is a uh, you know is uh, there's a really nice uh feeling to working at a place like monster because it's about helping people find jobs so if somebody gets that and somebody wants to work at a place that um, where they can impact people's lives in a positive way, then I feel like they, they could be a good fit here. And, and I especially can see that in people's cover letters. Welcome to the Schweiki Media Expert webinar series, where we team up with leading marketing and publishing experts to provide you with tips and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Margaret Magnarelli, and Margaret is the Managing Editor for Content and Senior Director of Marketing at Monster.com, the leading global platform for connecting jobs and people. She oversees a B2B and B2C brand newsroom team of seven that creates written, video, and interactive content aimed at helping candidates find jobs and helping companies find talent. Her team was awarded Best Content Program for the 2016 Content Marketing Awards from the Content Marketing Institute, Best Blog in the 2017 Awards, and she has been a finalist for CMI's Content Marketer of the Year. She's presented on Content Marketing for Content Marketing World, ANA, South by Southwest, Content Marketing Conference, and PR News. Previously, Margaret worked as a journalist, most recently as executive editor at Money Magazine and Money.com. Other noteworthy achievements is she's written a book on tween idols, she's an expert in all things charcuterie, and she helped to find the word snarky. And seriously, she really did. And today we are going to be talking about how Margaret Magnarelli from Monster.com utilizes content marketing to stand out in the job hunting industry. Margaret, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. No problem. And before we get into all of this good stuff, what, what's up with the snarky thing? How did you really do that? <laughs> well, um, I started my career as a journalist and working in magazine journalism, and I used I used the word in a freelance piece I did for Glamour magazine, and um, I discovered uh, much later that uh, MiriamWebster.com uses my uh, quote no. as a contextual definition for snarky in, in its uh, online dictionary. So that I feel like amazing. that's one of my greatest life accomplishments. That, well, <laughs> that, that, is, that will be a, a life accomplishment that not many other people can, can match, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I read that and I was like, what? How has she never brought this up to me? <laughs> That is crazy. Well, very cool. Very cool. Well, well getting into um, what we, uh, well, I say we're supposed to talk about it, but I love hearing about anecdotal stuff like that. But getting into, uh, you know, all, you have a ton of experience, obviously. Not only do you have experience, you have wonderful experience seeing that all the awards and, and everything that you've done. But before we get into, you know, your advice and tips and everything, I just want to hear you define what content marketing is in your words. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I get I would guess that you hear lots of different definitions of this sure. across lots of different people. Um, for me, I think I take a pretty broad stance that uh, content marketing is any way that you use messaging across your organization through, you know, the the traditional being blog, obviously, but also your social channels, your site copy, sales enablement, customer service dialogues, conversation design, et cetera. And using that messaging to engage with buyers, build relationships, and ultimately drive con- versions and revenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think to do it right, you have to be customer obsessed uh, and focused on filling their needs versus serving your own needs as a business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the sort of um, uh, catchier way I would say it is instead of sell, 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 it's about tell, tell, tell. Nice. And I like the way you said customer obsessed. A lot of people say customer centric, concentrate on that, but you're saying customer obsessed. And I think that's a great way to put you know, get your mind right, you know, just, you got to obsess over here before you do anything else, just obsess that way. And that'll help potentially lead not only the beginning and the planning, but all the way as you go through. So what, um, what gravitated you towards a content marketing approach as you were getting into this, you know, big biz, you know, you were leading up the marketing for this big business and, you know, what, you know, how did you go about that? Like, why did you go about that? Did something happen? Did anything significant happen? Or does it just feel right that that's the way to, that's the way you want it to go? Sure. Yeah. Um, I actually, you know, as, as my bio said, I worked in journalism for most of my career um, in, in the more the 
decade before I joined Monster. And um, I, you know, journalism is a is a um, increasingly hard business, obviously, to monetize. And I felt like, for one thing, I felt like journalism was actually becoming more like marketing. Uh, we were we were serving the advertisers' needs in a way that was not familiar to me from what what I learned in journalism school. And and I came to sort of realize like if I was going to be um, serving serving brands needs, I really wanted to do it for a brand that I cared about. And then it, I kind of tripped on the idea of content marketing in that way. The other thing that hmm. I was seeing was that we were we were using partners um, to serve up some content at at money. And those partners were um, companies and they were delivering content that was really good and as good as we were producing um, at money. And so that that also inspired me in this way. And 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 also my role is increasingly about driving revenue because of the challenges of, of uh, sustainability in journalism and, and thinking about how, how do we provide added value and ancillary uh, revenue. And and it, it sort of it sort of seemed like once I discovered what content marketing was, it seemed like a, a very natural next step and, and in particular my um, journalism career was really focused around service journalism which is um, a, a journalism jargon for how to and and that's really I think one of the best ways to uh, to do content marketing is really mm -hmm. to serve serve what someone needs to know how to do so so it, it really it, it was sort of something I tripped over and just realized that I had a whole lot of alignment with it and, and I really believed in it. It was kind of the way I had approached journalism, and so I've taken what I learned in journalism and applied it to uh, to business. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you, you know your life, the universe led you to become a content marketer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, yes, you all were, the signs. Were you know, they really were though. I mean, you were in this in the journalism world where, as you probably saw, what maybe four to seven, eight years ago. That and creative talent and everything else was getting devalued by a ton. Like just, it just like, well, you better find a different profession. You're going to make money being a writer, right? And yeah. then three or four years ago or more maybe, but around that, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, how are you going to stand out? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're going to stand out through fantastic writing. So, okay, writers, you're back on. But you you <laughs> uh, you have to be really good, and you got to learn some technical aspects of all of this stuff. But, hey, you got a career again. Yeah, and I don't I mean, think that's going to change. It's so funny because I've, seen, I've counseled so many journalists through this now where they have the sense that, like, oh, their skills are not, not – um, are, are not useful anymore, are not marketable anymore, and yet there's this entire world inside of companies that's you know, really hungry for their skills. But mm -hmm. but there is also a, a skills mismatch where journalists need to sort of sell themselves a little differently to to apply those skills to a company. And so that's I think the thing that a lot of people. Have oh, absolutely. Yeah. Whenever I'm talking to anybody who become writers, like, hey, that's fantastic profession, but you need to make sure you understand the nuances of search and the nuances of all this stuff and you know, look to maybe potentially figure out how to get better at video and, and incorporate all that. So if you can bring those entire skill sets, you're going to be very valuable. But just writers in general, if you're super awesome, you know, there there is a place for you um, for sure. So, but it, it's really funny how you went through all that. You really were set up to be, I mean, it would have been weird for you not to go into this profession <laughs> where, you, where your career was. So, well, that's okay. good. I'm glad you could see you could see my future. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know after the call what, what you're doing. And what am I doing next? <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know. Um, so, okay, you, that makes complete sense. It's obviously was a natural transition. So you got started, right? And you got going. I, I would love for you to take me back to the day when you first were getting going. You know, and, and um, believe there was obviously a ton of thought and upper planning. You're coming in. You're going this new direction. You know, can you walk us through how you nail, nail down your plan and, and potentially, you know, the voice that you all are going to roll with for Monster? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to thinking about that consumer. Um, and and when I first started here, I only had B two C to think about. I've only taken over the B two B content marketing in the last uh, four months. But uh, you know, it, the first thing was looking at. What that already existed uh, from a company perspective, and what we were, how we were already messaging to uh, to the consumers, to the job seekers, and and looking at the existing brand guidelines that were 
for advertising, which is a, obviously different than content marketing in that mm -hmm. it's periodic versus um, real time. But how could I translate that to um, to something that was of the moment? And then also, um, you know, really looking at like what that consumer job seekers experience was and, and how do we provide an antidote to um, the different challenges of the journey. I mean, I think job search is a journey we've all been through at some time in our lives or another, and it is an extremely challenging time for people. It is extremely singular. Uh, it is lonely. It is, uh, it is hard on your ego. You find yourself questioning a lot and, and looking at those moments and saying, how do we provide uh, provide the opposite emotions um, at different points of that journey and and then you know and then it was kind of like how do we um, what are some of the things that represent that voice to be able to do that so for example for me I, I came up with I think five different points that that defined what our voice would be in in our in our content efforts and and one of them was um, that we would always be focused on the first person on, on I'm sorry on the second person on you so using the you voice in um, in the headline or the first sentence of, of every story so that the audience knew that you know even though this is a singular process this is a, we're, we're with you we, you have you have us on your side so so that was an important part of, of how we would represent ourselves um, another thing was like making the content action oriented and giving people specific tools and dialogue and tricks that they could employ so that they felt smarter and more confident as a result of our brand and our content um, and and a, a third thing was was bringing humor into the mix and and um, it, you know being this is this is a stressful time. You you need to laugh it off a little bit, but but that that humor could not be snarky. You know, we needed something to help differentiate ourselves from the kind of um, bland service content that's out there. Mm -hmm. But um, but we we were this was not um, it's not on our brand to be um, to be snarky or sarcastic. Um, we're not buzzfeed. Want to be supportive. Yeah. yeah, we're not buzzfeed, and and being supportive is most important to us. So, um, mm -hmm. so we have to do it in a way that that feels authentic to the brand. So that was some of the points that we were thinking about. Awesome. So I mean, you basically lived what you said at the very beginning. You know, you obsessed about your client base here, and and you you went from that, and you know, then everything kind of grew. And some of what you mentioned that, yeah, I get to see immediately right when you say it, it seems logical and I get it. But was there more uh, digging or where did you dig? How did you dig to kind of find out, okay, hey, these are, these are what they're going through during this time. Was that already kind of known by Monster or is that something you did from, you tell me, like digging, where did you dig to kind of, you know, zero in on that? It, you know, it was known by Monster. Monster had done research on it, but also um, I think we we all did our own separate interviewing of people going through the job search process and, mm -hmm. and talking to people and sort of figuring out what their um, what what they were going through. And and there is a I, I don't I think probably like every buyer's journey, there is a um, everyone is unique in some way. Everyone is um, is their own delicate flower, but like but also there is a kind of a through line to the experience um, and so for example we know that um, people tend to um, maybe feel enthusiastic at the beginning of their job search um, and then they and then they like kind of lose a little energy once they don't hear back and then sometimes they go through a kind of mass apply moment and sometimes they feel this stress about a black hole and so so like knowing what those moments are and, and kind of and, and continuing to like refine in that like we've just gone through another um, customer journey mapping experience um, where we um, we worked with a with a consultant who helped us like put it out put it in emotional terms as well um, and so hmm. being able to um, being able to kind of revisit those those um, uh, perceptions and expectations periodically I think is valuable too. That's awesome. Now, so how did you get everybody aligned? You know, it sounds like, you know, you have a pretty good sized team. You have a gargantuan company. Mm -hmm. um, not sure how far up down the chain everything went uh, as far as, you know, alignment with um, what you're putting out there, you know, to align with your ad messaging, you know, um, I'm sure that, that, you know, that played a part. And, and then the ongoing, you know, you just mentioned some new things came about, you know, and so how how did you initially get everybody aligned? And then as you're moving forward, 
you know, talk a little bit about how you keep everybody aligned, you know, as far as what your suggestion is for how often you, you, you meet with your team. You know, you don't want to – you meet yourself to death, right? But at the same time, you have to be aligned. So can, can you tell me – and from your advice, I mean, you're working with a pretty large department here and huge company. How, how did you do it? How do you do it? Uh, I think, first of all, was getting um, alignment between what I wanted and actually getting my team to deliver that. So really, I focused on that first. And, and that really probably was the first, I would say, 60 to 90 days was me uh, working very, very closely with the team. At that, at, at that time, I had, um, I had only uh, three members of my team um, who I had who I had adopted by when I got here and and getting them who had been working under a different boss actually all three of them were working under different bosses and getting them on the same page and all of us um, creating content from the same perspective and the same voice uh, it really actually required me to like do a lot of digging in in that first in that first period um, and um, and and it was you know, at that, at that time, I think of myself more as I was in more of an editor role than a strategist role, even because I was like, I had to be looking at every piece of content and making sure that, you know, the headline and the sub headline and, and the, the display copy and the intro and the kicker really felt like they were of the, the voice that we wanted to be putting out there. And, and I think, you know, it was a, it was a hard slog. If you ask the people who worked for me, they'd be like, it was a hard slog that first, like, 60 to 90 days, but then, um, then they got it, you know, and I felt like at that point I could like kind of set them free to create that content. And then it became more about like, we're now we have a, a program in place. And so it's about, um, you know, conveying what we're doing to other people. And so some of that is, um, you know, I think content touches so many different departments within a company. And it, it, it was very obvious to me, especially because I work remotely from our headquarters that I needed to have meetings with a lot of people like phone meetings with a lot of people regularly, um, just one on ones, like, so that they understood what we were working on. Uh, so that so that's one of the things I would say has helped me create alignment is just maintaining regular communication with um, peers in different departments. Mm -hmm. um, and and also um, communicating up the ladder through um, through decks. Um, you know, I would say PowerPointing is like my least favorite thing about the corporate world, but um, mm -hmm. but I think it's like a necessary skill to sure. have to um, use to make your case for things. And so, for example, doing quarterly um, results decks um, to to management so they understand what you're working on, what value you're bringing. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, uh, people in, in the C-suite don't always understand what content is. And so I think it is up to uh, you as a content lead to help define it for them and help them understand what it is and what it's doing for the company. So, so that's, that's kind of how I've created that alignment. That is awesome. Now, what about when you do bring in new stuff or, or as you got going and you felt comfortable, I'm sure you didn't just be like, all right, I'm going to Hawaii now. Y'all take it and run, right? I'm sure you're, you're still, you know, you're not going to be, you know, micromanaging in the sense of micromanaging, looking over each piece of content like you needed to at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do to kind of oversee um, just to make sure everything is continuously staying aligned and nothing starts straying yeah. off too far? There are some things that I pay um, very close attention to, and then there are some things that I pay periodic attention to. And so, for example, we do a lot of um, we do a lot of updating of existing content. And with that, I don't feel as much need to be involved because I know the woman who's handling it is doing a great job, and like I've seen enough of her work to know that what she's putting out there is is um, consistent with the brand. When we're mm -hmm. creating um, new stuff, I will. I will sometimes leave it in the hands. I have a deputy on the B2B side and a deputy on the B2C side, and both of them lead the creative process. And so, you know, part of that is, is trusting them to, you know, having, having trained them well enough to trust them to take over on certain mm -hmm. things. Um, but when there is a big project, like when there's something new we're doing, um, or it's a big, um, something that has a lot of exposure potential, then I'm more deeply involved in it. Like, for example, we just did a partnership with, um, Hinunu, which is a employee, uh, a company review site that is a partner of Monsters. And we did a, a package of content with them that was about 
uh, companies that have the greatest worker satisfaction. And so it was a mix of their data and our data. And we put it out through our PR channels, through our, through our social channels, through paid media and, um, and organic and, and through our newsletters. And, and because this was going to have so much exposure and in particular uh, PR exposure, um, I really wanted to be involved and make sure I I saw every stage of that process and felt comfortable with it. So, so I, I, I sort of focus on, I, I know I can leave um, the kind of day-to-day -day stuff to my deputies who are great. And then I can come in and, uh, and be a guide and, and set terms really for things uh, when they're a bigger project. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're able to even do that just because of all that upfront work you did put in to get that yeah. alignment. Because if you wouldn't have done that, you would have been running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so you, your biggest point takeaways is, hey, get everybody aligned, and then you will be able, just like everything in the world, every business in the world, as you grow, you start taking care of stuff only you can take care of, and those mm -hmm. tasks start to grow and the other stuff, I mean, there's a still only a certain amount of time in the day, right? That's not changing. So, um, no, I, I hear you. I think it's like, it's a management lesson too, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. one that I still have to learn constantly, but it's like mm -hmm. you're, you're doing a, a good job if you're able to delegate, you know, that yep. means you're teaching the people below you to do what they do well and, and, mm -hmm. and to um, empower them to do their jobs. Absolutely. And on that note, that means you got to have a good team, right? So how did you go about building your team? Uh, not in the sense of uh, you not utilizing Monster, <laughs> I'm sure you did. but I'm talking about what were you looking for? What were you, you, you came into a team of three, now it's team of seven. And even with those team of three, I'm sure they become your team because you said, okay, I need this, 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 and this. Or I'm assuming, you know, as far as skills go, or, or maybe you didn't. I don't know. But what did, when you were building your team, what did you? What were you on the lookout for? What were you? What what skill sets were you needing? I mean, I think um, so. My team is made up of, as I said, two deputies who kind of head up the uh, creation of content on the B two B and B two C front. Two editors who report to them, and a writer. And then uh, a video producer and uh, a content strategist. And the video producer and content strategist like uh, straddle both B2B and B2C. Uh, and, and I guess I would say for, for the people on the creative side, what was really important to me was their creative skills and being able to see their work. I always give people a test. Uh, when they're candidates for a job for me, it tells me about their commitment to the job and mm -hmm. their ability to understand what we do and nice. their ability to to write well, which is the most important thing to me. Like I think that, you know, it, in um, and, and maybe that's not true. The video producer, it's not necessarily that they write well, but that's that the person yeah. can, can shoot an excellent video. Uh, but, but you know, to see their work and to see how um, how good their work is, like I, I don't have time to bring in staff that needs heavy editing, and, you know, especially not in some of these roles where I need them to, I need to be able to delegate to them. So so that, that has been a, a really important um, metric for me to be able to determine whether somebody is, is going to be a good fit for this team. I think in terms of uh, like sort of soft skills or or um, other qualities to me passion and empathy are really mm -hmm. important so the ability um, to, to see that someone is passionate about what we do I mean especially what we do is is a uh, you know is a, there's a really nice uh, feeling to working at a place like monster because it's about helping people find jobs so if somebody gets that and somebody wants to work at a place that um, where they can impact people's lives in a positive way, then I feel like they they could be a good fit here. And, and I especially can see that in people's cover letters. You know, not everybody submits cover letters anymore. And Weight Monster would say, you don't necessarily need to submit cover letters, but it certainly can help help make your case and and when you do submit a cover letter and you take that extra step to say why you think you'd really like to work at this place like that that means a lot to me sure. um, to me that's that's uh, it says a lot about the person who who is looking to fill the role and then you know the ability to be empathetic to that per to the job seeker I mean like theoretically everyone who's looking for and the people who are applying for our job should be empathetic to the job seeker experience but you know we don't always find that and so I think that's um, that's an important quality um, and and uh, you know I, I think that being able to come with great ideas is is 
also exceptionally important because I like, I don't think all the ideas come from me. In fact, like I think probably only like 20% of the ideas of this game come from me. Um, most of them come from the people on this team. And, and I think that I'm probably like a shepherd of ideas or a doula mm -hmm. of ideas, you know? And so, sure. um, so I think being able to uh, see that they, that they can think uh, creatively about our brand is also important. Awesome. Well, side note for those looking to, or looking to apply for jobs, you're hearing it from, Monster.com, <laughs> she's saying <laughs> cover letters are not every day anymore. So if you want to stand out, tell your story yeah. in that cover letter. And then from the salesmanship, follow up with a thank you letter. Just saying. <laughs> Especially do, for like, do, a, I, you know, what the surprising thing is like for content roles, like I'm, I'm surprised that people for content roles wouldn't submit cover letters because that's, that's what right? you're doing. Like you're a content producer. You should be creating content. Yeah. You should be telling an entire story of why, what they're about to see of your resume, which all look the same, right? So, yeah, awesome. All right, let's get into some of your secret sauce now. As we, we talked about how, you know, where your mind was in building your team, how you've kept everybody aligned, how you built your team. Just uh, now you're working with them. Now you gotta, now you got to do some good stuff on your content story. And I, I've seen you, I think you created this, if I'm not mistaken, but the how, well, now strategy. I've heard you talk about it a lot, and uh, I guess let me know if you created this, but uh, I believe that is how you move forward with a lot of your uh, content planning. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I did create it. Um, it, it for me, um, my in my last role working at Money, um, and and we had launched a website for Money uh, in 2014 because Money had been partnered with CNN Money and then um, split off and and started its own website. And what I saw in starting a website in in a very in a crowded marketplace um, at a kind of a late date in in um, in web creation was that there were different ways to engage audiences and that you really needed to think about the distribution of how you were going to get the content in front of people and, and that you would want to do different kinds of, of uh, content for different kinds of distribution methods. So, um, so how now and wow is the three pillar structure by which I think all of our content strategy ladders up to. And, and I think about it as kind of a, um, kind of a portfolio mix in a way it kind of like goes back to my money days of thinking about your diverse retirement portfolio that this is your diverse content portfolio and how is um how to content educational content that you know informs your audience about something that they need to know related to your brand's offerings or related to the general um, area of, that your brand plays in um, and i think that kind of content it can serve um, two different gods. One is SEO. So there's a kind of on-demand how-to that people need that people are looking for and turning to Google um, to, to find out more about. So for us, that's things like, how do I write my resume? Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a, then there's a kind of um, uh, clicky how content that is um, the kind of, the kind of uh, how-to that you don't necessarily know you needed to know, but if you saw it, you would click on it. So um, something like, you know, how to deal with the know-it-all in your office. So it's not something that I'm like, I'm, I'm so desperate to know the answer to that I was looking that up online. And, but if I saw that, I might click on it because I might have had that experience sure. in my own workplace. And so that's the kind of content you, we would create also for, for our newsletters and social channels. But, but the, the two overlap. And so I think the, the two kinds of how-to content can, can kind of um, play against each other and play in similar, um, in similar channels, like both do well for us in social. Um, some of the some of the SEO driven uh, how to content can do well for us in newsletters as well. Um, the um, the now is um, news responsive or data responsive or trend responsive content. So that's looking at something that's happening um, in the news um, or something that's happening in the zeitgeist or looking at some um, unique data that we have that feels very of the moment and being able to layer on um, monster insights or or layering on the monster data to a news story. Um, and that, that, you know, we sort of created um, for um, for PR purposes. Uh, we created it for social purposes because you can be part of the conversation 
conversations as they're happening. So if there's a if there's a flashpoint, um, we want to participate in that. So for example, like graduation, we're creating a lot of content around around that um, time period and flashpoint. Every time the um, BLS releases its uh, employment situation report, which is a monthly report, um, the first Friday of every month, we create a, an article about it and from the job seeker's perspective, what it means about where you should be looking for a job. So being able to um, tell stories as they're happening and it, it kind of takes the, um, it, one of the problems with simply going the how route with your brand is that it can feel a little um, uh, evergreen and almost too evergreen, doesn't feel um, uh, fresh. And so bringing in some of the now can help make your brand feel, um, feel uh, modern and of the moment and that you have your finger on the yeah. pulse of what's going on. And Love then um, wow is uh, content that is, uh, meant to engage on social platforms primarily, but um, sort of that that has that kind of sharing quality to it. So I think of that content as primarily being funny or emotional. Um, so that can be um, often for us, it's video content, but it can also be article content. Um, and, and, you know, that, that kind of gives people that feeling. I mean, I think that there's this kind of like millennial-ish trend. If you if you look at Instagram, there's this kind of feeling with all these humor accounts that like you know the kind of uh, response of like same and me me too like that that um, you feel when you when you look at something and and that's that's what I'm like hope to accomplish with the wow content. So that's you know that's the kind of um, structure that guides what we do both on on B two C and B two B and and you know it, it's a it's a fluid uh, dynamic and it's something we're constantly kind of adjusting and playing with like you know at times like I think you know we've we may have shifted a little more toward the kind of evergreen how content in in recent months and I've been thinking about moving a little bit back to a little bit more of the now and wow content and so I think I think it's the kind of thing it's, it's an organic process and we're constantly trying to like get the balance right and I think it, it will always be that way for us but it kind of it's just a, a a framework that helps us think about everything we're doing and, and whether we're serving the audience as well. Well, let me give you major kudos for coming up with something like that because, you know, I I don't know how many umpteen hundreds and thousands of hours of, that I've either been to conferences or read up on stuff or worked in it or everything. And there's, you can definitely, you took something that is very simple to understand your you created something that is very simple to understand from a concept that people don't always pick up right away. You know, there's a lot of confusion on, okay, what should we do? But I mean, breaking down the how, well, now, I mean, you, you're hitting on staying current, you're hitting on organic, you're hitting on what people are searching for and wanting to consume right here and now. And then you're also incorporating emotions through all this stuff with the, you know, the wow and everything. So, you know, to break it down, like some of the most ingenious things are the simplest things. And yeah, I just want to give you some major kudos on this to come up with that because you're hitting on so many touch points in helping people if they just go with this without even understanding all the like all the benefits that come from this, meaning the organic, the emotion, staying current, all this thing, you know, potentially hitting different stages of the buying state. Now you should probably if you really want to make sure, you definitely need to make sure you have your awareness, consideration of buying content. But you're going to be touching on those on accident by by going this. Well, you know, if you're just like just getting in and you're just getting started, start with the how well now, um, and then learn, keep learning and understand you got to serve different stages of it. But that's kind of next level thinking. But just if you want to get going, just start here. Now, I would like to touch a little bit more on the well, the how. Very easy to understand right when you said it. Now, very easy to understand right when you said it. Of course, we could probably talk a bit about that, about how you find out everything that's current and all that, but we won't get into that. But the wow, can you talk a little bit more about that? You know, what are some crazy things that you've done there? Any ideas that you can help with and, and maybe touch on like the very top one or two pieces of, of wow content that really moved the needle for you all? Yeah, sure. Um, I can talk about like a, a pretty vast range of things that we've done in that category because – I think that one is probably the hardest to understand for people and it is the hardest to produce because, you know, I mean, if we all knew the secret to social engagement, like then, um, uh, you know, yeah. then we'd all be millionaires, but, um, or not have so, jobs. So one example, <laughs> <laughs> right? um, one example, um, is something we did, um, about a year and a half ago, I think now, um, after Kanye West, um, announced he was, um, I think he said he was $53 million in debt. And 
one of my writers, um, and this, this kind of speaks to like the importance of having creative meetings regularly and letting people throw everything against the wall. Um, one of my writers said, I think we should write an article on that and like write an article suggesting some jobs on Monster that would help Kanye get out of debt. And I was like, well, that sounds crazy. And it's like a little weird for us, but like maybe like and he, 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 he's a, a very, very funny writer and he's a, he writes fiction on the side and, and has just a, a really um, deft touch with humor. And so I was like, why don't you take a stab at it? Let's see, let's see what it looks like. And um, he wrote something and it was funny, but it was not exactly on brand. It was a little, um, a little sarcastic. And, and so I sent him back and he did another version. And it was, it was good. And it was still, the, like the day, the same day that he had announced this. So we were moving really quickly, which is the benefit of having um, writers on staff. And uh, we published it and um, and our social team was very strategic in how they shared it on social. They waited until knowing that um, uh, Mr. West is a, um, uh, uh, uses social media um, uh, to as part of his uh, screed that um, they were waiting for him to tweet again about it and they set up an alert so that they would be notified when he tweeted and then they um, replied immediately with the article which meant that um, we were like among the first to reply in, in this um, stream and and we got a tremendous amount of exposure organically for this article and it nice. did incredibly well it got like I think something like 80,000 page views like organically and it was you know wow. it, and, and we got you know most importantly we got these like this kind of feedback on social media that was like you know you really made me laugh monster and there was like this like um one comment that I like screenshot and sent to my CMO that was like, I can't wait to go use Monster now. <laughs> you know? like, it was like, awesome. great, thank you, thank you for doing that, mom. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, so that was something that like sort of um, was a bit silly and you know was definitely a risk for us, but worked out um, really well. And then um, and then like another thing that we did um, was a, a series uh, called Life After Layoffs that we ran on our site and on Medium that was. Is um, a really heartfelt, a really heartfelt series. Um, first person, this woman who was a um, who was a creative director in New York, who, who wrote about her experience of being laid off and like the journey of like going from the day she got the pink slip and was crying in a hot dog in Times Square to the day she moved, like you know, four thousand miles away to a new job, and and it was done with this really like um, a tremendous amount of emotion and and um, raw. Um, emotion and also humor that um, what was really important about that was less like the the reach it got but more the um, the micro engagements it created like the responses that she got of people being like that you know that really sums up my experience or like it was so great to hear you say this I'm going through it right now um, so that that was really to me like a very um, a successful um, uh, way of of using how content in a different way that wasn't purely humor, but we've also done things like like play off of memes. Like we did a video series that was um, a takeoff on the BuzzFeed Tasty uh, food food creation videos, and so we did like recipe for a perfect cover letter, recipe for a perfect resume, where we were actually cooking up the resume and cover letter. Those mm -hmm. have been very successful. Nice. Um, we did a kind of um, a goofus and gallant kind of uh, take on um, on new grad. Uh, job searching um, called graduated and unemployed um, that that did well for us so so things like that tapping into tapping into humor and emotion I think is probably the the biggest piece of advice I can give on wow well I, yeah well I think there's another piece that you either you're being humble or maybe you don't even realize that it's happening is you know you set your team up to you know have that flexibility uh, to have to have that creativity come out uh, and a lot of times that gets stifled by certain types of organizations or certain types of managers um, and it sounds like that's the opposite of what happens for you it sounds like you leave a bunch of flexibility for people to bring you ideas and to come up with them on their own rather than just okay here's our plan let's not stray you know this but part of your plan looks like it encourages a little bit of straying encourages random acts of creativity basically yeah. right i mean i think, it, I think my job that is sounds like it's on purpose if i'm yeah, not mistaken totally. my, my job is really to to um set the term but like let the ideas come in and then say like you know this i, I try not to be like a person who says just no although i'm sure i do you know but i i, I try to um 
I try to look for how how we could take the idea and make it um, right for our brand um, and, and look at like whether whether an idea is how, how much we would prioritize it against other ideas that we have to do. So mm-hmm. I, I see that like my role is kind of in, um, in, in, in figuring out where those boundaries are and, and letting us like sort of stray a little bit outside of the walls now and again to see what happens. But, Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, one person can't come up with all the ideas. And I think if Mm -hmm. you, if you, if you just say like, Oh, the content manager or the, or the director of content is going to be the person who comes up with the ideas, you're going to have a very limited um, scope of what you do. And I, and I see when you bring a room full of people together, coming up with ideas, how many different ways you can, um, you can tell a story. I, I used to teach a, um, a class on how to freelance write. And uh, one of the things I would give to people as an assignment was giving everybody the same press release. And I would say, all of you have to come up with a one article to pitch off of this press release. And what was sort of beautiful about it was that you had a room of, of 25 people and and you'd have 25 different stories and you just wouldn't have any overlap. And so I think, you know, I think you, the fastest way to burn out is to say one person is responsible for ideas, you know, whereas mm-hmm. you can energize people by making it everybody's job. Awesome. Yeah. It sounds like a thing. I know lots of people would probably well, would love working for you, Margaret. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of times, not everybody's like that. You know, I'll just tell you, you know, a lot of times, a lot of stuff is stifled or, you know, you have ego involved and, you know, sounds like you put all that to the side for the greater good and, and happiness. It's a lot more fun to be creative. Um, okay, we're running a little bit shorter on time here, so I'd like to just touch quickly on some of the stuff you're tracking and your goals. You mentioned page views. You mentioned this. I'm sure you have your top, middle, end goals that you're paying attention to. What are some of the things that you keep a look out at, especially as a company as large as yours that, you know, there's a lot of macro numbers going around out there, you know, big numbers. So wh- what are you looking for to help drive your next decisions? Yeah, I mean, I think I think at the top of funnel, engagement is key. And so I am looking at those, like, quote, unquote, vanity metrics, like page views and visitors and, and shares um, and impressions. Uh, at, and then um, getting people into a um, a membership flow where we can um, they can be part of our email communication. So um, that you know getting them to the site is a big deal. I think it, from a from a first step because everything happens on our site. We're a brand. We're you know we're a staff company. It's all it all happens here. So you know we want to get you here. Um, so and then and then the middle to bottom funnel metrics that I look at are um, are you know getting people to look at the job ad. So doing a job search, doing a job, um, viewing a specific job, making, uh, starting an application for a job. And, um, and it, again, like getting them into that membership flow is, it is valuable no matter where they are in the, um, in the funnel. So, yeah. You're saying membership flow, you mean like sign up for an e-newsletter or something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then on the, on the B2B side, so I'm speaking mostly B2C there on the B2B side, um, again, top of funnel is engagement, getting them to the site, but then looking for the, the conversion path within the site. We're currently doing a, a redesign of our B2B experience, and, and we're really talking a lot about this now is like getting, getting people into a lead journey from the, um, from the site. So getting them, first step is getting them into the site, and then second step is getting them to, um, to become part of a, either, either to take an e-commerce action right away, although that's um, not likely for every customer, um, but but most importantly is getting them into some kind of a lead gen journey. Cool. So it really looks like to help drive next content pieces or down the road, you're really looking at engagements, um, mm-hmm. you know, shares, likes, comments, you know, just in, I'm sure, page on time, you know, how much people yeah. are spending on time. Stickiness. Stuff, stickiness, all of that. And then you're also tracking, okay, overall, I guess, quarterly goals or what you're looking at is like email signups, if not maybe sooner than that, but still those are bigger ones. But initially you're, you're driving, okay, Hey, this is, this is interesting because look at these engagements, look at these numbers. And then, okay, overall is our overall plan working by this. And then, because if you're looking at sales, I mean, you're not going to be able to make decisions in time to sway anything that would have affected a big number. So you definitely got to have those intermediate things that you're looking for. All right, uh, I'm gonna have to let you go here soon. Uh, let's see, give me your one piece of advice. If you had to just give one main piece of advice that you wanna either reiterate or say new here of something looking to implement a content marketing program, what would it be? 
Okay. Um, I guess I, I'm going to give you two. So one is like at the beginning, I think it's really important to take as much time as you can to be strategic. Um, and I would say I probably didn't do this as much as I could have. I, 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 I wish looking back, I had taken even more time to like get information, but I did do a lot of information gathering, sitting down with, with all of the relevant stakeholders for content, even, you know, not, not direct bosses, but I mean, those peers um, who work on the distribution channels that are important. So, you know, like SEO and paid media and social media, but also um, like the product team, because um, for us, our website is product and, and content is a product. So look, mm -hmm. talking to everybody and thinking about what their, um, what their goals for content were and how I could align my goals to their goals. Um, and also, um, you know, getting, spending a lot of time getting to know the customer. So, you know, if, if you don't have personas and customer journeys already in place, then trying to help create that or, um, or really getting to know that information, becoming one with it, like tasting it on the wall, start diagramming some stuff. Like that's the stuff that I, I didn't do when I first got to content marketing because I didn't really understand it as much. And, mm -hmm. and it sort of took me a little while until I got to like, Oh yeah, this is this is how this is different than journalism. But um, but I would say to anybody who's just coming into a new role that that's that's really important to start looking at like diagramming at each at each phase of the journey. What are the themes and what are the CTAs that we want to be pushing? And then and then you can start creating once you have that yeah. like that framework. Um, and then I would say the other thing that I would I think is really important is empathy. And um, I mean I think we can all agree that this 2017 has been like a pretty quite a year generally with all these natural disasters and tragedies and um, political divisiveness. And, and I think even though um, as marketers, we are constantly being pushed toward um, being more data and automation centric um, and, and theoretically that like this should all skyrocket our business results. I also think that um, because of this crazy world we're living in um, and because everything is so automated. I really think the human to human um, contact is necessary even more. And so being able to find that um, connection and, and to be, to be solutions oriented, but, you know, you, I think, I think um, empathy is even ahead of, is even before solutions. It's like, it's about before you can even propose the solutions. It's about, you know, saying to your customer that you understand how they're feeling and, um, and listening to them and, and showing that you acknowledging how they're feeling. And, and I think uh, that that's a way that we can make, we can make real connections with, with um, customers in the future. Awesome. So what I'm hearing is plan, 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 <laughs> and plan, <laughs> and make sure you tie in emotion, which basically means obsess about those people. Yeah. And with, if you obsess about somebody, you're, obviously going to get into emotions. So awesome. Margaret, I think you definitely gave away some really good advice today, especially if somebody's just getting going. Uh, I hope I didn't give away all my secrets. <laughs> oh, no, I'll, I'll tell everybody. I'll, I'll send a link to your personal profile with all your uh, logins and everything. Don't worry. That'll, it'll be a link at the bottom of the, of the, of the blog. Uh, well, besides getting all of the, your, your uh, login information and everybody else can do, how else can people continue to learn from you? Um, you can follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Occasionally I say things about content marketing there. Um, and um, I'm always happy to um, you know, increase my network with other practitioners because I'm always learning too. And, um, you know, I, I, I think I, I don't feel like it's always the people who are on stage that are the people you can learn from. So I'm, I'm really eager to, um, to meet all kinds of people doing different things in content marketing. All right. Well, very, very cool. And just for the listeners, uh, her Twitter is at M Magnarelli. That's at M M A G N A R E L L I. All right, Margaret, until next time. And thanks so much. Thank you. It was great talking to you.